Hello, pharmacology class, and welcome to respiratory medications. Susan Greider here, and again, we're going to talk about not only respiratory medications, but the disorders um, and some of the lung issues that would require respiratory medications. When we think about lung disorders, we need to think back to pathophysiology. Why is this happening? What is going on? Why is oxygenation not occurring? And some of the um, reasons for this we want to think about are, is there a problem that is restrictive or is there a problem that is obstructive? When you think about restrictive, think about the air can't get in. Things that would cause air not to be able to get into the lungs, or into the bronchioles, into the pulmonary system. Things like asthma, constricted bronchioles. Um, for some reason, again, the air cannot get in. If we're thinking about obstructive, then we're thinking about the air can't get out, things like COPD. If we can't expel all the air in the lungs, then air is retained. If air is retained, old air is retained, and new air can't reoccupy the space. Therefore, oxygenation doesn't happen with obstructive problems as well. Okay, if we think about um, is there a problem at the tissue level or with diffusion? Um, if oxygen, you know, oxygenation also depends on the ability to take deep breaths. If there is a spinal cord injury, if there is a brain stem injury in which there is no drive to breathe, if there is something wrong with the chest, perhaps broken ribs, a flailed chest, um, for some reason the diffusion is not happening. Um, or the person can't take a deep breath. There can also be a problem at the arterial level. Um, when we think of this, we think about, okay, there is not an obstructive problem or a restrictive problem, but it's all the way down to the arterial and the venal, venous level. So when we think about that, think about anemia. If there's not enough blood and not enough hemoglobin to carry the oxygen, then oxygenation can't happen as well. You may have lungs that are orderly and lungs that are working, but if you don't um, have enough blood, enough hemoglobin, there's no product to carry the oxygen. Also think about cardiac output. Cardiac output is your stroke volume times your heart rate, but if your heart's in failure or for some reason your heart's not pumping enough blood, even if you're not hypovolemic or anemic, then there could be an issue um, again, with that oxygenation because there's not enough to carry the um, oxygen. When we're here we, is just a little um, slide that looks at uh, blood passing through your lungs every minute. So if you think about this, and if it, the longer it takes the blood to go through or oxygenation to happen in the lungs, then the work of breathing is going to go up. If the work of breathing goes up, uh, cardiac output is also going to go down. So those op happen in opposite. If cardiac output goes down, work of breathing goes up. If the work of breathing goes up, cardiac output is also probably going to go down. Perfusion is also involved. And perfusion is the diffusion of molecules from the veins and arteries into the tissue cell. Um, Things that can affect diffusion are osmotic pressure, uh, arterial and capillary pressure. This slide shows the different gradients as well as the different pressure numbers. You don't really need to know or specifically know each of these um, numbers, but know what osmotic pressure is. So when we talk about diffusion, we're talking about simple diffusion here is just the transfer of the molecules. There is no semipermeable membrane involved. So an example of diffusion would be if I put sugar in my coffee and stirred it, then sugar would diffuse throughout the, um, throughout the coffee and all of it would be sweetened. Versus if I think about uh, osm osmosis, osmosis has to go across a pressure gradient or a semi-permeal membrane. So with this, it's not only going uh, across a gradient, there has to be pressure involved and it's going to go through the cell membrane, or it's going to go through the blood-brain barrier, or there's some type of pressure gradient it must cross. Some reasons. Let's think about reasons we would have respiratory failure or respiratory difficulties. And when you think about the reasons, you also need to think about what are you going to do about it. 
We need to treat the cause of the dyspnea. So if we have heart failure, what medications would you give? You would give diuretics as well as digoxin. If you have digoxin is going to slow the heart rate and increase the force of contraction, correct? Therefore, slowing the heart rate and increasing the force of contraction is going to increase your cardiac output. If your cardiac output goes up, your oxygenation is going to go up. Diuretics are going to reduce the fluid volume. If we reduce the fluid volume, the heart has, a, has less um, resistance to work against, and therefore cardiac output is going to go up, and your oxygenation is going to go up. Asthma is a problem with restrictive airflow. So we can't get the air in. If we can't get the air in, we need to bronchodilate the tubes or the bronchioles that allow the air to get into the lungs. Pneumonia. Pneumonia is an infectious process. And with pneumonia, you're going to have a buildup of phlegm and mucus within the lungs um, that is, it can be viral, it can be bacterial. But with pneumonia, you need to not only treat the symptoms um, and decrease the mucus or thin out the mucus, but if it is bacterial, you would need to treat it with an antibiotic to um, get rid of the infection. Pulmonary embolus is going to be an obstructive airway. So there's going to be a clot somewhere stuck in the respiratory um, tract. And you're going to need heparin to dissolve that clot. Farmer's lung has to do with inflammation. And that would be treated with steroids. COPD is an obstructive problem. You can't get the air out. If we can't get the air out, we can't get new air in. But we also need to make sure that we try to open and bronchodilate because it does have some restrictive components as well. We treat that with nebulizers. Um, abdominal distension, if the abdomen is distended and pushing up on the diaphragm, that diaphragm is going to invade um, the lung cavity, as well as it won't be able to fully um, descend and retract to get full breath. So you need to treat the cause of the abdominal distension in order to increase respiratory function. Anemia, again, we talked about that a minute ago. If there's not enough blood and not enough hemoglobin to carry the oxygen, you're going to have decreased oxygenation, and therefore, we might need to give a blood transfusion. A patient has a fever. What's that fever going to do? That fever is going to increase heart rate, correct? It's going to increase metabolism. It's going to increase the need for oxygen. So we're increasing all of our need. We're decreasing cardiac output by increasing heart rate, um, and therefore, the oxygenation is going to go down. So you would need antipyretics, maybe cooling blankets, ice packs in the groin, um, in the axilla, um, on um, different baroreceptors to reduce that fever so that um, our cardiac output could return to normal or go back up and our oxygen consumption would go back down. Pain, pain similar to fever can increase heart rate. Um, it can um, uh, again, increased heart, heart rate, which decreases cardiac output, and um, we would want to treat that with pain medications. Metabolic acidosis, we need to correct the cause of the acidosis, correct the problem in order to fix the oxygenation. How do we limit the work of breathing is next on our list if we need to limit the obstruction. And let's talk about some ways we would limit the obstruction. Um, first thing is to think about meds. We would give bronchodilators and steroids. Bronchodilators, um, again, are medications that are going to open up the airway, open up the airway, going to get more oxygen in. Um, steroids are going to reduce inflammation. So if we reduce the inflammation, we're also going to make that pipe or that tube bigger. Bronchodilators work a little differently but steroids um, are going to reduce that inflammation. Purge secretions with expectorants like guaifenesin or cough syrup. Guaifenesin is the same thing as mucinex. So if we thin out the secretions, they're easier to get up and get out of the body. And then we have limit non-productive cough to limit inflammation. So when we think about cough, think about it two ways. If it's a wet cough, if it's a purulent cough, if it's a mucousy thick cough, we need to get the mucus out. We need to encourage cough. We need to get mucolytics to thin it out. If it's a non-productive dry cough and there is nothing there to get up but the patient keeps coughing, then that 
chronic cough or that constant coughing is going to increase the irritation to the airways and increase inflammation. So you want to give cough suppressant to a dry, non-protective cough, but you want to encourage cough and thin out the mucus to a thick, mucousy, or purulent cough. Bronchodilators. Think about bronchodilators and let's revisit back to exam one, what it meant to be androgenic and anticholinergic. So androgenics are gonna be those types of meds that what? That jack you up. They're gonna be the ones that hit fight or flight. They're gonna be the ones like epinephrine or have that epinephrine fight or flight effect. So they're gonna increase your heart rate. They're gonna increase your metabolism, right? Um, when we talk about anticholinergics, the big thing to remember with your anticholinergics, remember our can't see, can't pee, can't spit, can't, um, uh, as we want to say, the bad word shit. Um, so you, the constipation is a big issue there. So that constipation could also what? We just talked about the belly. If the belly is distended, then it's going to what? Push on the diaphragm and decrease their ability to take a deep breath. So bronchodilators are great because they do just that dilate the bronchioles, but we have to worry about the androgenic and the anticholinergic effects because those can have an opposite effect and cause us to have less oxygenation, possibly. Then let's think about inhalers versus nebulizers. Inhalers are like what's in the picture here. Those are also known as MDIs or metered dose inhalers. So every time uh, a patient uses those, one of those, they get a specific dose inhaled. Um, a patient needs to be taught how to use it correctly, um, but it is something, when it's an inhaler or an MDI, it's something that can be carried in their pocket, it's easily and readily used, it's usually very convenient. When we think about a nebulizer, that's um, what has to be a liquid, it has to be poured into a machine, it has a mask on it, or some type of like piece pipe looking thing, and the patient needs to be um, hooked up again to this. It is utilized off of room air, it is not an oxygen source, but they will breathe in and out on the mask or the pipe looking thing um, for anywhere from five to 10 minutes. And uh, this actually, a nebulizer actually allows the medication to get deeper into the lungs. It does work better, but it's harder to use, can't transport as easily, and takes longer to administer. So the MDIs are easier, easier to use, more convenient, but don't work quite as well. The nebulizers are gonna be a little more difficult to use, but deliver a better source of the medication, deliver the medication to where it needs to go to. So again, a better delivery system. Let's think about the asthma um, medications. You have albuterol, it can be nebulized. You also have, let me move this out of the way. It won't move out of the way. Okay, well we have albuterol that can be um, in an MDI or it can be nebulized. Albuterol has a few different names. It can um, also be called provental. So you'll see that a lot. Um, you can also have, uh, the question here underneath this where it says recording it is isoprel. And, it, and it, the question here says, may isoprel be nebulized? And the answer is yes. What isoprel is, another name for uh, isoprel that you'll recognize is epinephrine or adrenaline. So yes, we can nebulize epinephrine. We do that very often. Um, we call it racemic epi or adrenaline, and that is nebulized in asthma attacks um, as well as in anaphylaxis. It works more significantly than albuterol, but what's it gonna do to the heart rate? It's epinephrine. What's it gonna do to the metabolic system? It's epinephrine. So it increases your cardiac risk, right? We talk about steroids. Steroids can be IV push in an emergent situation. They can also be inhaled. They can also be in a pill form. Generally, we're talking about a respiratory. We give it IV if it's severe enough, and we will give it inhaled um, more as a maintenance medication. Um, if it is given inhaled, the side effects are significantly decreased. It does not generally go 
body wide. It stays right there in the lungs. So you have less chance of high blood sugars. You have less chance of increased risk for osteoporosis, joint damage, uh, cataracts, all the bad things that go along with steroids. We would prefer to use them in um, an inhaled form, but in the inhaled form, they're not as potent. They don't work as fast. So in emergency situations or in severe situations, you will need steroids IV push. Um, but if we're using them IV push, again, they're going to work better, but they're going to go systemic. So if we go systemic, you're going to need to worry about um, all the bad side effects, high blood sugars, again, increased osteoporosis, increased joint damage, um, the mood swings, the increased hunger, uh, tendon rupture, um, as well as chances of Cushing's and Addison's. We talked about that on the last exam where you, your body has too much steroid or the sudden withdrawal of the steroid can cause Addison's crisis, which can be life-threatening, can put you into renal failure. So steroids that are IV push always have to be tapered and not just be suddenly withdrawn. Amylophenone drip is a medication, or aminophilin is also known as theophilin. Um, aminophilin is an older medication, um, very popular about 20 years ago, 20 to 30 years ago. It is very rarely utilized nowadays, so I'm not going to push you too much for aminophilin. I doubt you'll see much of this used. But just to give a brief synopsis of it, aminophilin, usually if a patient, you know, 20 years ago was in significant problems, we give them an amylophilin drip in the ER. We give them a loading dose, and then we keep them on a drip for a little bit, and then we would follow that up with PO medications. The one thing, there are some things to think about with amylophilin or theophilin. If it is given, it can cause hyperglycemia, hypotension, arrhythmias, seizures, and toxic levels. So if a patient were to continue on this, they have to have maintenance levels drawn, just like you would with lithium or digoxin. They have to be in a certain range. It can be toxic. Let's talk about our MBIs, our meter dose inhalers. Um, we did talk about rescue inhalers. There is albuterol would be your most common rescue inhaler, which is also known as provental, proventolin. So those are three names, all mean the same thing, all the same drug that you might see. Those are given, uh, a meter dose inhaler is generally given on an as-needed basis. It is a rescue inhaler just for that exact reason. It is to rescue. So it is given when someone is having a acute attack, um, an acute bronchospasm, an acute event. It is given, again, PRN. It can be given two puffs every four hours as needed. General rule of thumb when we're talking about rescue inhalers if a patient is using their rescue inhaler more than twice a week, then we need to change their therapy. We need to put them on some type of maintenance therapy or some type of other inhaler that has a longer acting window and keeps them from using their inhaler quite as much because we are not giving them adequate coverage. So again, more than twice a week, then we want to change that um, therapy. The, the time that this does not apply and that rescue inhaler um, rule of using it more than twice a week needs a maintenance med is in exercise-induced asthma. Exercise-induced asthma um, is a little bit different. If you have um, exercise-induced asthma, you take your medication a little bit differently. You take it 30 minutes before you exercise. Again, you take it 30 minutes before you exercise, not when you're in trouble. What it will do is it'll bronchodilate before you go exercise and will reduce your chances of having um, an event during that exercise. Secondly, if you have exercise induced asthma, if you exercise more than twice a week, that whole maintenance therapy, is, if you're using it twice a week, certainly does not apply. Okay, now let's also talk about combination inhalers. Some of your combination inhalers are one of the most popular is um, called Duoneb, and Duoneb or Combivent is a combination of 
albuterol and um, um, ipotropin, which is also known as atrovent, the easier name to say is atrovent, but you'll recognize it um, as ipotropin or ipotropium. This medication is given, um, can be given up to four times a day or up to every six hours. Uh, the duonep or the combination of the two medications is a bit more powerful than just the albuterol alone. Um, it does have tachycardia that goes along with it. So does albuterol, both products too. So the side effects, again, can be counterproductive. Pop back up there to that um, combination, uh, that atrovent or um, Combivent or duoneb also does come in a nebulized form. If we think about, this is another combination um, inhaler. It is a combination of um, a long-acting bronchodilator along with a steroid. So the steroid maintenance inhaler is going to be Theravent. The long-acting uh, is a long-acting androgenic. Um, one inhalation twice a day. This is not, any of your maintenance inhalers are not for rescue. They are for maintenance. So that means we are trying to prevent a problem. We're trying to prevent that asthma attack. So even if the patient is not having an attack, is not having issues, is not having respiratory distress, you need to continue this twice a day every day. Your um, long acting androgenics are contraindicated with beta blockers. Okay? It's the, another um, one of these is Advair. Advair is some is some Adderall, which is a bronchodilator, a long acting, longer acting um, bronchodilator combined with reticulone, which is your steroid. With any steroid in, uh, any steroid um, medication or that is inhaled, you need to possibly they could have hyperglycemia. But again, as I mentioned before, generally that's with IV. Um, I was reading a study recently that um, showed that a, a patient that was given, um, patients that were given Theravent or given um, inhaled steroids, and it did not increase their um, blood sugars. So it generally does not, it's generally not a problem, but theoretically the possibility is still there. The big problem that you will see, and like the hyperglycemia, is candida or oral thrush. So, with these medications, the steroid medications that are com combined with um, a beta, I'm sorry, a bronchodilator, you take one puff twice a day. You always need to make sure that they rinse their mouth or brush their teeth after the use of these. Well, actually, with any inhaler, they need to rinse their mouth. Um, even just the bronchodilators can cause thrush, can cause um, some mouth sores and mouth irritation. So make sure that you're getting them to rinse their mouth as a nurse or brush their teeth. Also, if they do have any issues with thrush, also want to check them for that thrush, which is the white coating on the mouth and tongue, and they would need mycostatin or a swish and swallow to treat that. Okay, here's just a, a, a picture of the Advir. Um, it comes in several different strengths. They push the lever down um, right here, push it down with your thumb. It opens up a little, precious little pocket pill in there, and then the patient inhales it. It says here right on the side how many doses are left. So the patient does know how many are left. Another medication um, that is frequently used, you'll see, is Spreva. It is a long-acting anticholinergic. So again, remember your anticholinergic, can't see, can't, can't pee, can't spit, can't poop, right? Um, once daily, not for use with a rescue inhaler. So your or it's not to, be, not to be used as a rescue inhaler. So again, all of these, maintenance, 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 they are not for rescue. You have to worry about glaucoma because of the anticholinergic effect. Um, can cause blurred vision, so watch for falls. Can increase BPH or urinary retention, so watch for UTIs, um, watch for increased BPH, and watch for that constipation. And that's all, again, related to what? The anticholinergic effects, right? Just another picture of the Spreva. The Spreva inhaler does not actually come with any medication in it. You get a package of pills or a bottle of pills on the side. The patient is taught to take that pill, 
put it into the container, close the container. When they push the button, it pops that capsule, and then they breathe the medication out of the capsule. But the medication is not loaded into the inhaler like Advair. Advair comes with the medication preloaded in like a little disc pack. The Spreva is a separate, in, separate just plastic inhaler with nothing in it, and they add their own pill. Okay, when we're, let's move on a little bit to a, a slightly different topic. Um, we were talking about more asthma, COPD, um, medications for that, but now we're going to think about um, epiglottitis and croup. Epiglottitis and croup, bronchodilators will not help epiglottitis and croup. What is the problem here? In this picture, you can see a child, and kind of hard to spot, but the right here or towards the top, you can see the child's lips, and then we see the airway. Okay, the epiglottis is swollen on this child. If your epiglottis is swollen, what that can do is if it swells and it closes up, it not only restricts airflow in through the trachea into your lungs, if it swells enough, it can cause a complete obstruction and complete respiratory failure. With epiglottitis, again, the epiglottis is swollen. With croup, the airway or the trachea just below the epiglottis is swollen. Um, the bronchioles and the airways in the lower part of the respiratory tract can additionally be swollen, but we worry mostly about epiglottitis being an epiglottis problem and croup being a tracheal problem. They are both inflammation problems. They are both swelling problems. So if something is swollen, we need to decrease the swelling. The primary treatment for this is steroids and usually a cool mist. Um, the cool mist will help decrease the inflammation as well, kind of like ice works on an injury. Cool mist can sometimes help decrease the swelling and croup or epiglottitis. You would never ever suction a croup or an epiglottitis patient. If you do, it's going to irritate that area and it can cause an obstruction, a complete obstruction. These patients, especially children, they're going to sit up. They won't be able to lay down. They're going to do this thing called a tripod maneuver where they lean forward on their elbows and literally drool. They can't swallow their own spit because they can't swallow because this area is so inflamed. So those are just some signs and symptoms you might notice if you were taking care of one of these patients. And again, you might think you need to suction them because they got all this drool running out of your mouth, but that you cannot suction them. It can cause increased inflammation and cause that airway to completely obstruct. Okay, again, to limit the instructors or limit the obstruction, you possibly, if it is croup or epiglottitis, you need steroids, steroids, steroids. The bronchodilators are not going to help. If it is um, some other problem, you may end up giving them bronchodilators. Um, they aren't going to hurt the patient, but in general, if it's epiglottitis, it's not going to help. Um, the steroids are what they need. Purge secretions with expectorants. Again, we talked about this before. If we've got a problem that's an obstructive problem, if they have wet secretions, what do you do? You thin them out. You give them um, guaifenesin, which is a mucolytic, which is mucinex. If you have a dry, non-productive cough, we're going to give them dextromethorphan um, or suppress the cough. So this slide is a little bit confusing because it says, Herd select secretions, um, it says give them a cough syrup. You don't give a true cough syrup to someone who has a thick mucus. You give them something to thin it out, but you don't restrict the cough. You encourage cough. If you have someone that has a non-productive cough, then you want to reduce in irritation. Then that's where you give them a cough suppressant. Okay, next we have decongestants. Um, we have pseudofedrin which is good old Sudafed. Nowadays, you have to sign for it. You have to show your ID. You have to be 18 years of age. It works quite well. Um, it does increase heart rate. It does cause um, palpitations in a lot of people. It is controlled because it is utilized in making crystal meth. Um, then we have phenylephrin. And those are the little red tabs I'm sure you've all taken, the cold um, preparations and allergy preparations that are available over the counter that you don't have the sign for. Those are the ones that have phenylephrine with it. Generally, phenylephrine will have that increased pulse, increased heart rate, not quite as significant as pseudofedrin, 
for Sudafed. Um, the phenylephrine is not as strong, doesn't work quite as well, but it is not controlled. Um, and when I say controlled, that does not mean a scheduled, like a NARC, but the pharmacy does make you sign for it. It is over the counter. It is um, considered OTC, not prescriptive, but you do have to sign for it. Both of these dry secretions. So they open up and they um, decongest the nasal passages, allow you to breathe a little better, but they can have a rebound issue and they can dry secretion. Okay, some preventative medications. One of the medications that used to be preventative, um, we used to see a lot used was chromalin. Um, and that is, if some of us are older, might remember primatine mist that used to be available over the counter. Very difficult to find over the counter. I'm not even sure you can still find it um, in the United States. Um, they don't generally sell primatine mist anymore. But in other countries or people that come from foreign countries, we will see this product still utilized. Um, leukotrienin blockers, uh, another form um, of blocking that inflammation or keeping it from occurring, are things like monolucast, which is also known as singulair, and zarfalucast. Um, what these do is they block the leukotrienins, and leukotrienins cause inflammation. So generally, this is not at all used for rescue, but can be taken for exercise-induced asthma, can be taken um, for asthma in general, may also be taken for allergic rhinitis. Generally, if they're taken on a routine basis, they are taken at bedtime. Um, one reason that they say to take it at bedtime, especially in kids, is it because it can cause some mood disturbances and some GI distress. They're less likely to have side effects if you take it at bedtime. Our next category is antihistamines. Antihistamines um, are going to be like your Benadryl, your Allegra, your Claritin, your Zyrtec. They all are going to have anticholinergic effects. Depending upon the medication, the anticholinergic effect is going to be stronger. Benadryl is going to be your most sedating. Claritin is going to be your least sedating. The Zyrtec and the Allegra are kind of in the middle. Some other drugs in here might be Atarax. That would be prescription. But there are a lot of antihistamines there out there on the market. Main thing to know is remember drowsiness. So you've got to watch them for fall risk. You've got to watch them for driving um, and that anticholinergic effect, which is, again, you can't see, can't pee, can't sit, can't shit, right? Okay. Can they afford their medications? Big issues. That's one reason why they might go with a lesser expensive generic, split a medication instead of giving them a combination medication. Um, maybe they can't afford an Advair inhaler because they're quite expensive. Um, even an over-the-counter medication may be their only route for a drug assistance program. Let's go on to now, we've limited the obstruction, we need to limit the restriction. So limit the work of breathing. How can we do that? We need to treat what's causing the restriction. If their belly's distended, let's fix the abdominal distension. If it's because of constipation, we need to make them go to the bathroom, some type of stool softener, increase, in, um, increase fiber, um, a laxative, uh, uh, an enema, something. Um, if it's because of ascites, perhaps that needs to be drained. Um, if it's a GI issue, perhaps they need a GI referral. Um, it may be positioning. They can't lay down. They need to sit up, just like with that epiglottitis patient. We need to sit them up, lean them forward. Um, something called purse lips expiration. And that's also um, called PEEP. PEEP is positive and expiratory pressure. You will see COPD patients do this all the time. And what they do is they breathe in through their nose. They breathe in slowly through their nose to get as much air as they possibly can in. And when they breathe out, they actually purse their lips and they breathe out against pressure. They create their own end expiratory pressure. And the reason this is done, just like it's done in a CPAP machine, it's done to create to keep the alveolar life up from collapsing. Because with a sudden ex exhalation, what happens is those alveoli can collapse. They don't have enough back pressure to keep them open. So when a patient has COPD or has an obstructive problem, very often they'll breathe out with those purse lips, create their own peak. And what that does is it keeps the alveoli open while they slowly exhale as much as they can. So they'll have longer exhalations. They'll, again, breathe out slowly, and they'll breathe out through pursed lips. We also need to treat pain. If a patient is in pain, they're probably going to hyperventilate. They're going to use more oxygen. Their cardiac output is going to go down, so we need to treat the pain. 
here we just have, uh, again, we're talking about breathing in slowly through the nose for expansion and breathing out slowly with that first lip or that peep to facilitate outflow. Um, some reasons for restriction. Um, we could have a pneumothorax. If we had a pneumothorax, that has to be treated with a what? A chest tube. We cannot give a pill for that. We cannot give a pharmacological intervention for that. That needs to be treated with a physician with a chest tube. If there is a bleb, a bleb is like a big mucus pocket. A big uh, something is stuck up in that in that space, and it's not allowing that lung to expand fully where it should. That could also need to be drained. It may be treated with antibiotics. Depends on what the substance is that is in that pocket. Okay.